standing. Standing ovation for Charles Duplox. Oh, oh. He's not good. Oh, he's doing all the right things here. Yeah, he's he out of the. Oh, I hate watching all these leg attack positions. Certainly a lot of against somebody like Daniel Daryush. Trying to get around to the back. There it is. That was it. This morning, I'm speaking to you on a phrase that has inspired me, and the phrase is called the Eye of the Tiger. The Eye of the Tiger, this phrase was originally coined to denote the toughness and laser-like focus of a soldier once wounded in battle, once thought to be even out of the war, who through determination and discipline gets back and once back becomes a nightmare for his enemies because he really should have been taken out by the injury completely but instead he's back he's tougher he's wiser he's more self-disciplined and probably not going down as a result of the same weapon and strategy that took him out the first time a little smarter when you learn a lesson in the school of hard knocks, it can stick with you a little more than one that you learned in the book. And when you have been almost taken out by something, you should have the eye of the tiger in that area. There are very few of us who wouldn't recognize the intro to the 1982 hard rock hit, Eye of the Tiger. The song was written by the band Survivor at the request of Sylvester Stallone for his Rocky movie series. And it became a hit in the Rocky III movie. The punchy staccato riff of the song was intended as a pulse that would recall the sound of boxing gloves and the to and fro footwork of a boxer's bounce steps. I, I did a little boxing. and. Uh, it's a, uh, you understand this term, the eye of the tiger, when you do. Most of us now vaguely associate the expression, the eye of the tiger, with perseverance and sporting achievement. However, there are very few people who understand the real meaning of the expression from which the song gets its name. So what is the meaning of the eye of the tiger? Number one. Having the eye of the tiger means being laser focused on achieving a singular goal. And number two, being in the eye of the tiger refers to a kill or be killed situation because tigers have a unique situation. Tigers are striped and so with the stripes blending into the natural foliage, you can't exactly tell which way is forward and which way is back on the tiger. So on the back of their ears, they have an eye. So if a predator is looking at them from behind, well, the sense is that they are watching even their back. They're watching even their own back. And, but just before the tiger kills its prey, it bends its ears forward and the victim can see the eye of the tiger. All right, we will talk about the first one first. The eye of the tiger as a symbol of single-minded determination. Like humans, tigers have eyes that face forwards. This gives us both what is known as binocular vision. Binocular vision derives from the fact that our two fields of vision overlap to create a three-dimensional image. However, tiger's binocular vision is far more advanced than that of humans. This allows them to assess distances and spatial depth with extraordinary accuracy because the tigers need to know how far their prey is. Just as I, I do bow hunting and I have a range finder and it's important if you're a bow hunter to know the range and the tigers have a, a great sense of that. Another unique thing about tigers eyes is that they have more rods than cones. Rods are what allows us to accurately see shapes 
while cones are responsible for the ability to see color. Tigers hunt their prey at night, and a high rod count allows them to de detect the movements of their potential kills due to a heightened sensitivity to spatial changes. Cats only require one-sixth of the light that we humans do in order to discern a situation. They have an amazing night vision. Kind of made me mad that when Biden pulled out hastily out of Afghanistan, he didn't first secure our military stuff and take it with him. We left 18,000 night goggles in Afghanistan for our enemies to have use of. In the uh, American dream, the fact that tigers do not need much light to be able to stalk their prey serves as a good metaphor for the fact that those who are fighting to survive can persevere despite the fact that they do not have many external resources symbolized by the light. Instead, as in the ideal of the American dream, they are drawing on inner resources and a single-minded and sharp determination to do what they have to do to win. That phrase really ministered to me lately because I am a situ in a situation where I'm, I am in a brisk competition with another business here in town. The reason that our businesses are though so similar is because my dad started that other business. And he started it in 1949, around the time of the building of the Hungry Horse Dam. He had three daughters, which he figured would be a good waitress crew. So dad started, he bought a big hotel and he turned it into a restaurant. And then he began experimenting with the local berries, particularly the huckleberry. And he began even making pies. He's the first person to my knowledge that began making huckleberry pies out of the berry and began commercially selling those pies. Then he went down to a business in Bigfort called Eva Gates that was making huckleberry jam and he kept snooping around down there and asking questions and finally even said, Eva said to him, Willows, I told you all I'm going to tell you. Would you please get out of my shop? <laughs> and so he came and started pioneering the recipe to make a huckleberry jam. He figured it out and he became the second person in the world that I know of to make the huckleberry jam. And it was very successful. So, um, he got his business going and it was called the Willows Honeyberry Farm. Today it's the Huckleberry Patch. And when I was like three or four years old, he gave me a job. He said, all right, you think you're man enough to work? I said, yep, I am. And he said, all right, uh, you take this fly swatter and you kill the flies and I'll give you a penny a fly. And I, after, he had a ton of flies. <laughs> He had way more flies than we do. And after a while, I, I came back and, and reported accurately, Dad, I got 103 flies. And he said, that sounds like an awful lot. From now on, I'm going to make you actually bring me the corpses as proof before I give you the penny. So I still had my job, but now it was tougher because I had to bring the, the penny. I had to bring in the corpses. Um, then, by the time I was five or six, I got my own apron. Dad was a great psychologist. It wasn't like, kids, you got to work. It was like, he'd make it like a psychology thing to make you feel like you were really something if you could do it. So I got my own apron. And by the time I was seven or eight, I was on the schedule working 30 to 35 hours a week as a dishwasher in the establishment. And, and it was... Uh, some might have thought it was, well, that's child labor. But for our family, it was a little different because we came from a hard working line of uh, people. My grandfather, they called him Buckskin Jimmy Willows, he joined the Kansas ranch of Buffalo Bill Cody when he was just 13 or 14. And back in them days, it wasn't running away 
It was just, that's what a lot of people did. Cody himself was a driver on the Wells Fargo stage system when he was only 13 or 14. And people just got going in life. And so Buckskin Jimmy got a job on Cody's farm when he was 13 or 14 and worked his way into the Wild Wild West show, that show that he had that went around the whole United States mm -hmm. showing the West. And so, so for us, it was just kind of life as usual to, to work at a young age. And I worked in different capacities in the facility during the next 15 or 17 years, including he had a t-shirt shop and I, I liked that. I liked finding beautiful t-shirts and selling. But when I was, when, when dad was about 70 something, he said, bud, I'm gonna go for broke. And I said, well, whatever you think, dad. And so he borrowed a ton of money, just borrowed clear up to here to start a summer playhouse. And he had built, I, I was the carpenter at that time, and I built, and me and Jay built this big summer playhouse. And, uh, and he hired eight people from some play school in Dallas, Texas, and had them do it plays. It was kind of a neat idea. But at the same time, he made a college. Jeremy McNamee still, his family live in the huge college that dad made. And uh, all this debt just kind of killed the goose that laid the golden egg, his business. And then the economy turned south and dad lost his business to the bank. I, at this time, I was a missionary in Jamaica. So I couldn't just stop what I was doing and run home and, and uh, save the family business. The bank only wanted 120,000 for that place, but I didn't even have 1,000, let alone 120,000. So a couple that sold jewelry in dad's store actually bought it from dad and started running the business. And they were sympathetic of us kids because they knew we'd lost our inheritance and everything. And they were kind of kind and even uh, gave me this picture, which I himself, I myself am in, that was in dad's t-shirt shop. And anyway, uh, after about 10 years, they sold it for two or three million to a, a corporation that is a big time corporation. They own a lot of casinos. They own a lot of uh, established gift stores throughout Montana and Idaho. And they had a, a very different mindset about me. They thought, well, let's buy him out. But when I didn't want to get buyed out, they became very, should I say vicious? Mm -hmm. To squish me like a bug? Because they had all this multi-million dollar corporation and here I'm just a, a mom and pop trying to do my best. And <clears throat> yet I'm competitive by nature. so. I kept making gains in my market share. Hi guys, how you doing? Make yourself at home. We have a little service here, but you can still shop and just check out on this side when you're done. And uh, I guess it's okay. What do you think? Hmm? I don't know if it's good to have luster going up to the people. What do you think? I know a lot of them think it's cute, but the last few people just left, so maybe we'll keep them. Um, <clears throat> he's just doing his job. I told him to be an evangelist, but it's not working out too good today. Okay, so I kept making gains in the market because during the COVID years, like they wouldn't even open until 10.30 and they'd close sometimes early. Me, I'm in here working my usual 12 or 14 hours a day and we were making some gains and things were good and maybe I got a little bit complacent even. And then this year I come back and I can tell every aspect of their business is hitting on all eight cylinders. They must have got a new manager or something because it's really looking good. They're sending their spies in here to check on our prices so that they try to beat us in the prices. And all of a sudden, I find myself in a in a war and uh, in a in a battle to keep my portion of the market share. My April was down 21 percent from the year before. My May was down 16 percent. 
Now, you got to be a realist. You can't say, well, whatever, I'm going to let go and let God do it. That only works in a religion that is the opiate of the masses. The truth is, to go forward in life, you've got to You've got to embrace your situation and do what you got to do to survive and to thrive. And so, friends, um, this in this eye of the tiger, laser-like focus in a killer be killed environment, I began paying very close attention to every detail of this business. You might notice that the lawn looks beautiful this morning, and other aspects of the business look great and we assembled a pretty good team of, of people with a new cook and my sister helping on weekends and Cherry helping out. And we began doing the absolute best that we possibly could. And God was working together with us to strengthen us, like your word was good. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we really got it looking nice. And there was a time yesterday, during yesterday's business, where we just had cars lined up all up and down here, the fanciest gear, the fanciest cars, and this place was hopping. It was rocking, man, because we took that eye of the tiger mentality and we uh, went forward with a laser-like focus and made something great out of what God had given us. Hallelujah. Amen. And that, at that point yesterday, when I'd been working my tail off to stay in competition with a worthy rival, this song came on my playlist. Rising up, back on the street, did my time, took my chances, went the distance, now I'm back on my feet, just a man and his will to survive. So many times it happens too fast. You trade your passion for glory. Don't lose your grip on the dreams of the past. You must fight just to keep them alive. It's the eye of the tiger. It's the thrill of the fight, rising up to the challenge of our rival. And the last known survivor stalks his prey in the night, and he's watching us all with the eye of the tiger. Face to face, out in the heat, hang, hanging tough, staying hungry. They stack the odds till we take to the street for the kill with the skill to survive. And that song ministered to me. And I thought, wow, that's, that's just what I've been doing. I've having a laser-like focus to get this place going well, to not lose my market share, and to stay in brisk competition, to stay in the fight. And uh, it's, it's, it was paying off. All right, the second aspect of the eye of the tiger. The eye of the tiger as the last thing you see before you die. Another interpretation of the expression, the eye of the tiger, as it is used in the hit song, refers to somebody who is not the tiger, but they are the prey of the tiger. The tiger is after them and the last thing they see before they die is when the tiger puts its ears forward and you see the eye on the ear of the tiger. In this interpretation, the tiger's eye represents a situation of existential immediate danger. It requires incredible tenacity, intensity, willpower, and strength of character to survive when facing the eye of the tiger. My father, James Lake Willows, he was picking uh, rose hips up there four miles up the reservoir. And <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, but it's a true story. He took his britches off to go number two by, by a tree. And in that position, a big strong cougar leapt off of a leapt off of a a, a cliff and, and was targeting dad and he would have killed him but there was a blue spruce tree that was dad was crouched by and he hit that spruce tree just a little and deflected off just two or three feet away 
Now Dad is as naked as a peeled banana. Um, he doesn't have bear spray, doesn't have a knife, doesn't have a gun. And there he is in such a vulnerable position with a, a killer. And he said it was quite a duel for about a half an hour where he just started to talk to him, easy boy, easy, easy boy. And finally, it took a long time for him to even get his pants up. And once he did, he was a little bit more emboldened and threw a few big rocks and shouted. And the cougar's just thinking, should I kill this guy or, or what? Well, what's this guy trying to do to me? I should just kill him. He don't even have a weapon. But you can tell he's fighting that instinctual fear of man. And you know, my dad would wake up and sometime he'd be all sweating. I said, Dad, Dad, you okay? He said, I'm just having a dream of that cougar again, a nightmare. And but dad liked to wear a bolo, and the bolo had a cougar's face on it. Why? Because it kept him on his toes. Mm -hmm. Life is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Life and your adversary, Satan, might like to squish you like a bug. I have a, a, a few rivals in this town that would like to squish me like a bug. I used to sell drugs in this town. And one of them, when I quit and became a Christian, <laughs> That little thing right there, that's a bullet hole. And uh, somebody shot, and I think I, I'm not saying I know for sure who it was, but I think I might have a few guesses. And fortunately, I had bulletproof glass, bullet tempered glass. But, you know, we have adversaries, we have rivals, but the Bible says God prepares the table before us in the presence of our enemies. And so, um, in this number two uh, scenario, you're not really the tiger, but there's maybe some situations in your world that are trying to squish you like a bug. And it's in that situation that you need to have the heart of a lion. You, you need to have that desperate, determined, laser-focused determination uh, to go forward to achieve what you need to achieve to not only survive, but eventually thrive. And I like... I like the Bible story of David at Ziklag because in that story... He really expresses what I'm talking about, the eye of the tiger, where the enemy tries to squish you and tries to put you down, but you just muster that courage and strength through God to do what you need to do to stay in the game. I like David because he was a baller. He killed lions. He killed bears. He killed Goliath. His father-in-law wanted a hundred foreskins of the Philistines for him to have Micah's hand in marriage and he did one better than that. He went out and got 200 Philistine foreskins because <laughs> Saul thought, well maybe David's going to die doing this, but instead David lived, David thrived, David went forward. And so he's a guy that had some victories and yet He's in a, a very difficult spot here, and we find it here in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 30. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud till they had no more strength to weep. <clears throat> and uh, David's two wives had been captured. Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. Now, why did he even have two wives in the first place? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, God made Adam and Eve, and 
I'm sure this probably has provided a stumbling block to quite a few guys. And it's amazing how our own weaknesses can be amplified in our offspring. Because David's son, Solomon, ended up with 600 wives. And many concubines as well. And Well, maybe David should have just had one wife. <laughs> maybe he would have... Uh, um, not had a son that had 600. Um, but the men talk about stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. When really hard things happen to you, it can make you bitter. Mm -hmm. I, at one time, I had a 10-room mansion with an indoor movie theater on 10 acres. It was a lovely spread. And I got served divorce papers in 2011. And I, I lost not only my mansion on 10 acres, but to keep this business, I, I had to give several other houses. I lived in a pickup because I wanted to keep my business. I felt like if I kept my business, I could eventually get back on my feet. And it was a rough time for me. I'm telling you it was a rough time. Sleeping in a pickup when you'd formerly slept in a 10-room mansion on 10 acres, come on. It was a hard time for me. But God was there for me, even in that most difficult of time. I remember sleeping in that pickup in Austin, Texas, and and it, it was raining a lot. And I'd, I'd gotten sick, and my lungs were plugged up and I, I was having a hard time and I just got on my knees on that little piece of property I was buying I said God Isaiah 41 says you're a helper to those that need you and I need some help and I looked up and there was the neighbor's place and I went over there and I said you guys got like a room or anything I could rent and they said well yeah we rent out this room for $20 a night <laughs> so I went in there and I stayed the night but they also had like a dog kennel, so there was like a billion dogs barking all night long. Like, <laughs> about the time it settled down, another one. <laughs> and um, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm gonna die if I, <laughs> I'm gonna die of sleep deprivation if I stay here. So I looked on Craigslist and I found somebody that said, we have a room that we're willing to rent out for 300 bucks. And, I was paying $18,700 of child of alimony and stuff, so I, I barely had enough to put, put food in my mouth, So, but I could afford 300 bucks. So I got in this place, and this good-looking blonde girl had this guy living with her. As soon as I get in there, the guy ditches her <laughs> and takes off. So I'm in this place with this good-looking blonde girl, and she's drinking vodka all day long and smoking cigarettes. and. And uh, not that there was a lot of temptation for me because I'd never been that attracted to alcoholics, but it was kind of an awkward situation. And sometimes she couldn't keep the light bill on, so I'd have my son over. I had him on the weekends, and he'd come over and he'd say, Dad, why are there no lights? <laughs> and I'd try to make up some excuse to keep my custody for, with my son. And that was a hard time, man. You go through times like that, it's hard times difficult times but I'm telling you I kept myself encouraged in the Lord my God a lot of people go through divorces they don't 67 percent of them don't go to church anymore they don't regular in church but I kept going to church I kept my faith I kept reading the Bible I kept myself encouraged in the Lord and now praise God I not only have one house I got two nice houses I got a house on the river here that you've seen and I got a nice house in Austin Texas because I, I got it back and that's what David and his guys did they got it back and instead of just staying bitter I could have got bitter man I could have got bitter I, I was tempted to get bitter but I, I tried to be like David and find strength in the Lord my God and then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? 
Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So David and his 600 men decided, all right, enough of laying around, feeling sorry for ourselves, going drinking and irrigating our wounds. We're going to go and get our stuff back. That's that eye of the tiger. He'd been, he'd been decimated as a future king, as an individual. All his stuff, all his children, all his wives, all his possessions, taken. But he brings himself up from the ashes. He says, I'm going to go get it back. And they go with their swords and whatever they had to cross the ravine. And then as he's about going, uh, a third of them, 200 guys said, I really like your go for it spirit, David. <laughs> We're tired, man. We just came back from a, a raid and a war ourselves when we found this. We're too tired to go. So David had to deal with the fact that a third of his group said, nah, we can't do this. And so David said, all right, well, you stay. We'll just kept going. And they kept going and they kept going forward and they found an Egyptian. They found an Egyptian that was almost dead. And they said, man, what's wrong with you? He said, well, I was with these Amalekites and they, they went down and they attacked Ziklag and they burned it with fire and they left. And, but I got sick and they had to leave me. And, and so they were kind to him. They fed him, they ministered to him. And, and then when he got revived, they said, would you take us to him? He said, you gotta swear you wouldn't betray me to them. And they said, okay. So the Egyptian took him down to the raiding party. And, and now keep in mind, David had just been back from a war. He'd gotten back, all his stuff's gone. He, he takes off, he finds the Egyptian. You know, that's a good point. Be kind to people. Be kind to people. You never know who, who you're gonna be. Uh, mm -hmm. Who that person could be an angel in disguise last summer one of my huckleberry pickers was really thinking of ending his life and I so I texted him and I tried to encourage him and one time when he didn't have a place to stay I said you can stay in my pick I think it was the same one yeah it was the same one I, I stayed in when I went through my difficulties and I got some nice meal and put it there with him in a blanket well, now that guy's back on his feet and he's an excellent worker for me. He's a cook, hallelujah. You never know who you're being kind to. But David went and uh, found them in the evening while they fought all night long. That's, that's the eye of the tiger, man. Fighting all night long when you already been two days fighting and doing all your stuff. Fought them all night long, killed every single one of them except a few that got away on camels. And they got all their stuff back and they came to the camp. And the 200 men came out to greet him. And some of the men said, Man, those guys, they don't deserve to have none of this stuff. Just let them take their wives and go home. David said, No, they at least stayed and guarded at the camp. They're, we're going to share and share alike. Amen. And then what David did is he took some of the plunder and he sent it as presents to the leaders in Judah. He sent it as presents. And it wasn't long after that that those same leaders came and crowned him king. So in his difficult moment, he got the eye of the tiger. He went and recovered what he had. And he uh, even had some gifts to give to secure his future position. Now what is it with you, my friend? What arena of your life has been withered away or stolen away or pushed down by your adversaries, rivals, or by the devil himself? Is it your health? Is it your dream? Is it your financial uh, prosperity or livelihood? Something like what I experienced? Whatever it is, I want you to refocus yourself today. Refocus and, your, and determine in your heart, nah, I'm gonna get it back. I'm not done yet. I'm not through yet. I'm gonna get back what, I'm gonna go into the enemy's camp and take back what you stole from me in Jesus' name.